in uh, Psalms, of course, the whole book of Psalms is one of my favorites, but Psalm 119, uh, if you're a Bible believer, if you love this book, it's got to be one of your favorite places in the whole Bible. Uh, Psalm 119 is about this book, boy, I mean, just everywhere which way you look. But if you look down to verse um, 153, Psalm 119, verse 153, longest chapter in the whole Bible. Consider mine affliction, and deliver me, for I do not forget thy law. Plead my cause, and deliver me, quicken me according to thy word. Salvation is far from the wicked, for they seek not thy statutes. You know, so the Word of God is going to be in every verse, one way or another. It's in, that, in, in, in every verse. Great are thy tender mercies, O Lord, quicken me according to thy judgments. Many are my persecutors and mine enemies, yet I do not decline from thy testimonies. I beheld the transgressors and was grieved, because they kept not thy word. Consider how I love thy precepts. Quicken me, O Lord, according to thy loving kindness. Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. Princes have persecuted me without a cause, but my heart standeth in awe of thy word. I rejoice at thy word as one that findeth great spoil. I hate and abhor lying, but thy law... Do I love? Seven times a day do I praise thee of thy righteous because of thy righteous judgments. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Lord, I have hoped for thy salvation and done thy commandments. My soul hath kept thy testimonies, and I love them exceedingly. I have kept thy precepts and thy testimonies for all my ways. Are before thee. Let's pray. Father, help us now this evening. Uh, help us to uh, rejoice around this book. Love this book. And may we encourage God's people to read it, to study it, to meditate therein, to live by it. Let it be a light and a guide that we might live our lives pleasing and acceptable unto thee, that we might know thee and thy mercy and thy kindness. Lord, Fill our hearts and our minds and our spirit with thy word. We'll thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Now in verse 60 said, Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. I want to give you seven little reasons tonight why I believe the Bible is the word of God. Now when I say Bible... I don't want anybody to misunderstand what I'm referring to. I am not referring to some Greek and Hebrew text or Latin text uh, that I can't put my hands on. I'm not talking about any original autographs that nobody can find, that nobody's ever seen. Um, I'm not talking about uh, the Texas Receptus or the Received Text or the Minority Text or any. I'm referring, when I say Bible, I'm referring to that King James 11, uh, 1611, laying there in your lap. I believe in a Bible that I can get my hands on. And I believe the one that I have is inspired and preserved. And if you laid the Greek New Testament and the Hebrew Old Testament right up here on this podium beside of this book, I wouldn't bother to open the covers. I would read to you and preach to you from this King James 1611 Bible. This is, without any question in my mind, the very Word of the living God. You don't have to worry about anything being omitted or added. It is perfect. It is without error or admixture of error. It is the inspired, infallible, inerrant, preserved Word of God in English for English-speaking people until the second coming of Jesus Christ. In 
34 years of preaching, I've never referred anybody to the Greek. I've never said a better translation would have been. I've never said uh, it's unfortunate that the translators rendered it this way. I have, by the grace of God, tried to preach and teach and to the best of my ability live what I find in English in this English Bible. And I've found over the years, if you follow this book, you'll come out just fine. Uh, you don't have to worry about anybody having superior insight. You don't have to worry about anybody finding nuggets you can't find. Um, I know Dr. Ruttman gets criticized all the time for saying that the, the King James is superior to the original Greek, but he's demonstrated that hundreds and hundreds of times. Um, you know, There are things you can find in this King James Bible you can't find in the original text if you had it which they don't. Maybe you don't understand. When, when, when all the scholars say, when all the modern-day preachers say, the original says he's a liar. He's a liar. Nobody, nobody has the original. It doesn't exist. The original was written on real cheap paper. It's called papyrus, but it's like newsprint. And it got passed around and read and passed around and read and, and, it, and it did just what your Bible does. It wears out. Uh, I've got a couple of old Bibles at home. The first Bible I ever bought after I got saved was a little Nelson Bible about this big. And in a year, I had to replace that Bible. I'm telling you the honest truth. If you'd seen it, you'd have thought that Bible was about 100 years old. I literally... And I'm not exaggerating one bit. I literally wore holes in the pages from turning them things and, and thumbing back and forth through that. Thing. I wore that Bible out. So it just literally fell apart. I don't have it anymore. That's what happened to those originals. They got copied. They got read. They got used. Not like those vellum scrolls, those leather scrolls, that were found in monasteries that nobody ever read, nobody ever looked at. The average Christian working a job raising a family was reading a Bible printed on newspaper. And they wore them out. And so the originals are gone. So when those guys get up and make all this fuss about the original manuscripts or the original autographs, he's just blowing smoke. He doesn't have them. He's never seen them. Nobody's got them. What they're calling the original is they've got a handful of texts. P74, P75, Vaticanus, Sinaiticus, Alexandrinus, uh, found in Catholic monasteries and various sundry places over the centuries. Uh, and they think that they can take those texts and reconstruct the original. Of course, it's not perfect because they keep improving it. They have to keep redoing it. They have to keep making new copies. But somewhere in those 4,000 plus manuscripts that exist, if you were wise enough, you could take those 4,000 manuscripts and reconstruct the original. So when they say an original, they're talking about a pile of almost 5,000 manuscripts that collectively contain. Well, that ain't worth a hoot. Now, God didn't let the world get in that kind of mess. When God gave England rule of the seas, and God gave England a King James Bible... England started the greatest missionary societies, the greatest missionary outreach the world has ever seen. And when he had an English king, Prince James, James is Jacob, you know, same word. Uh, when he had Prince James on the throne and Britannia ruled the waves, the sun never sets on the British Isles, God gave an English Bible to go around the world. That's the book you've got laying right there in your lap. 
And don't you ever let anybody talk you out of it and say, well, it's old-fashioned and it's archaic and it's hard to understand and uh, this, that, and the other. Read some of them new translations. They're pretty hard to read and understand. And they have a lot of archaic words in it. Uh, the New American Standard says, Is there any taste in the purslane? P-U-R-S-E-L-A-N-E. Purslane. Anybody know what that is? Well, now your King James Bible said, Is there any taste in the white of an egg? You're talking about archaic, antiquated words. Purslane is a pretty old, archaic, antiquated word. Uh, not one person in a hundred knows what it is. But the new and better translation uses that old archaic word. A lot of help, right? Now, I've got this King James Bible here, and we could spend, and I have in time past, spent a great deal of time giving um, historical reasons, geographical reasons, uh, linguistical reasons, uh, textual reasons why that King James Bible is the Word of God. Tonight, I, I want to keep it somewhat more simple than that. I want to give you seven things, as briefly as I can, that there's no other way to explain. Uh, I, I believe the Bible is the Word of God for these seven reasons. And on the face of it, these things look very simplistic. But a lot of times, simplistic things are deceiving. A lot of times, they have a lot more depth and breadth to them than people give them credit for. Um, a lot of times a thing looks simple uh, because it is so clear. Things look complicated a lot of times because we muddy the water. Now, so I want to give you these seven things, and, and there's nothing uh, new. There's nothing earth-shaking, except I really believe if you'll stop and think about these seven uh, points, the seven premises, that you'll have to conclude the Bible has to be the Word of God. Now, the first thing is this. i tell you one of the reasons I believe that the Bible is the Word of God. Number one, it is the only reasonable alternative to evolution. There are two theories and two possibilities. Science has something coming out of nothing all by itself. The Bible said in the beginning, God, obviously pre-existing, created the heavens and the earth. An intelligent force, an intelligent being with unlimited power caused a thing to take place. That makes perfectly good sense. Everything you can see in this world, when you look at it, you have to conclude that somebody made it. Nobody ever looked at anything. Not one time in your life have you ever looked at anything and deduced from looking at it that it just happened. Yet that's what science wants you to believe about everything that is. It just happened. Well, the truth is, science knows Nothing, and I mean nothing, just happens. Uh, th there are some incredibly scientific reasons why evolution is just retarded. Um, intelligent design and information theory and a whole bunch of other stuff. But l l let me give you one example. I've used this thing for years. I borrowed this from Dr. Ruckman. I just, I, I'm asking, I just stole it, what I did. But it is so simple and so profound, I've never seen anything that illustrates the point any better. If you've got a better illustration, don't let me know it because I'll use it. It doesn't bother me a bit to borrow material. Here's the illustration. There are four possibilities, four possibilities, on how everything that is got here. There are four possibilities, and there are only four. If you will look at them, there are, there are no other possibilities. These four possibilities 
exhaust 